okay, good afternoon. I, I realize, okay, sorry, they told, told me not to walk backwards and forwards. And so I will try to stay here. And also, you see, with my, well, my name being Italian, I also tend to wave my hands around when I speak. Uh, so I will also try to keep them still. Uh, my name is Francesco. I've been working with you know, functional programming for, well, well over 20 years now, 20, 25 years. And my kind of love, my passion with functional programming started in 1991 when I started well, taking my computer science degree. And the very, very first language they taught us, we all got in there you know, very cocky, how you know, we know how to program, we know Pascal. And so, you know, just to bring us back down to earth, the very, very first language we, uh, they taught us was ML. Uh, how many of you have worked with functional programming languages? So very, how many of you have worked with programming languages which have been heavily influenced by functional programming languages? So, it's not much. Uh, now, you might not use functional programming languages on a daily basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, but by learning them, by understanding their paradigms, and by programming in a functional way, you'll end up being much more productive and you know, becoming much, much better programmers. And this is what this talk is about. Um, this is what this talk is about well, today. Uh, I'm going to... So, I never really kind of understood the power of functional programming uh, until probably a few years later. So, ML was great, it was cool. We had some really, really interesting uh, exercises in university, and I was impressed by how compact the code was. But it wasn't until uh, 1994, so three years later, when the teacher... Uh, I was studying um, the parallel computing course, and the teacher came in, and waved the very, very first edition of Erlang Programming, so it's the book right there in the corner, and said, read it. He took the exercises, waved them in the air, and said, do them. And when he was done, he started lecturing about the horrors of functional... Uh, not of functional programming, about the horrors of parallel programming. And he, we were young, we were impressed, and we got scared and worried, because you know, the message was, it's hard, it's tricky. Now, n none of that came through, though, when we were working on the exercises. And the exercises consisted of a simulated world where we had carrot patches growing, and we have rabbits going around eating carrots, and if they ate a lot of carrots, they got fat. They split up in two. If they didn't find any carrots, uh, their energy levels would go down, and they'd eventually die. And then we had wolves running around looking for rabbits, and if uh, a wolf saw a rabbit, they would try to go in and eat it. And the, the wolf would also broadcast to other wolves, hey, there's a rabbit close by, there's food, come, come have a feast. The same with the rabbits, if they saw a wolf, they'd alert other rabbits within a radius. And if you had, um, if you had, uh, and if they found carrots, they also tell other rabbits, there are carrots over here, uh, uh, come and eat. And it was, you know, the way we programmed it was that each wolf, each rabbit, and each carrot patch was a process. Uh, it was the first time I had come across lightweight processes. Um, I don't know how, many, how long you know, many of you have been programming, but I do see a few white hairs. If you remember um, the deck workstations, the old deck workstation, at the time, they could handle, the OS could handle 16 threads, one six. So you could have 16 parallel tasks, well, concurrent tasks happening on an OS level. Yet, here we had hundreds of rabbits and wolves and carrot patches. And I remember going in and typing PS minus EF, and then actually just seeing one, well, seeing Emacs, of course, I was seeing my X clock, uh, two or three X windows, as well as a version of the Erlang virtual machine. At the time, it was called the Jam. So all of these hundreds of processes were all running on one single VM. And I was very, very impressed. And you know, I was wondering what, you know, what happened to all of these horror stories the, 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 the lecture was on about. You know, he was telling us about you know, no shared memory, and so how your memory got corrupted if you weren't careful, how you needed to use mutexes to access your shared memory, how 
you had race conditions in threads, how you got deadlocks. It wasn't a pretty sided painting, yet you know, we didn't see any of this when, 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 we were, uh, when, when we actually did our exercises. And the reason for it is that the lecture was talking about mutable state. And we were using a programming language, however, which had immutable state. So the concurrency model he was lecturing on was based on you know, what was accepted at the time as being the concurrent building block, threads, versus immutable state, which was what we were using for the exercises. And there are two ways, well, basically, to do this concurrency. So if you're dealing with mutable states, you must have shared memory, you must have threads, you must have mutexes when you access critical sections. If you're dealing with immutable state, what you do is processes will not share memory. The only way for them to share data is through message passing. That means you need to copy the data from one process to another. And they'll then each have their own copy. So two completely different programming paradigms, two completely different results. And for years, you know, I kept on telling everyone, hey, guess what, you're, you're programming Erlang. It's, it's, it's fault tolerant and it's scalable. But it actually took me a good 20 years to realize why we were running around saying that, because all we were doing was actually repeating it. And the trick, once again, hides in immutability, and that's you know, what I'm going to focus on now. now little disclaimer, it, it's happening now all the time, but uh, especially with, with Trump going in and tweeting. Every time he tweets something, I'm sure you can go into his tweet history and find something where he's tweeted the opposite. And a little disclaimer, yeah, September 2010, I went in and said, don't use the word immutable they might ask you what it means. And, well, good thing is I'll try to explain it now <laughs> for you. Um, what is immutability? Uh, you know, when you study differential equations, so algebra, lambda calculus, and to a certain extent even geometry, this is what they taught you. Is that right? So y is equal to x squared minus 1. Now, this is immutable state. So basically what you do is you share what you have, and you copy what you, what you can't share, basically. And when you call a function with no side effects, what that means is every time you call that function with the same set of values, you will always get back that same result. That is a mutable state. Mutable state, when you're dealing with shared memory, you call a function with a set of values, you don't know what value you're going to get back. So it makes it very, very different. So you, you've got determinism versus non-determinism here. And immutability will mean that you can actually share data across processes. And it's guaranteed, when you share this data, it's guaranteed that it won't be changed by others. And if you're, doing, if you're basically going in with a no-shared memory approach, you need immutable data structures. And that's where you know, concurrency comes into the picture. Now, all of this went out of the window when you started, they started teaching you to program, because this is what they told you. They said x is equal to x squared minus 1. And this is plain wrong. Uh, you know, this is actually mutating things, which means that you go in and you change, change the values. You mutate that value. And you know, by being immutable, you can also argue that languages don't have side effects. That's incorrect. All languages will have side effects. They will have some form of mutability. Uh, and you know, the, the whole goal is to try to decrease this mutability as much as possible. So, for example, Erlang, Erlang will have Erlang term storages, ETS tables. You'll have I.O. and you'll have message passing. Um, Haskell will have monads, as another example. And, you know, the point here, you know, if you have threads, shared memory is fine as well, and it's, it's a good programming model. Many of you will probably be running on the JVM. You'll be using Java. And you can do that, but what you need to do is make sure that your threads become immutable. So you can, share, you can change the data within a thread, but if you've got two threads communicating with each other, you need to mimic this whole message passing approach. You need to copy the data from one thread to another, avoiding having shared state. You following me here? Yeah. So what are the problems with, uh, with mutable state? You've got two threads, 
and they're accessing the critical section, which is right here in the middle. What happens if one of your threads crashes whilst it's actually accessing the critical space section? You know, your process crashes, you need to go in, you will not know what state it was left in. You don't know what state the shared memory was left in. And that means you need to go in and terminate all of the threads which actually have a dependency towards that shared memory, which you know, becomes fairly, fairly heavy uh, if you're relying on it. The second problem with, uh, with, well, with, with threads and shared memory is you know, where do you locate your shared memory? You've got a thread running in London. We're dealing with distributed systems today. And that's the future. You, you, you've got a thread running in London, you've got a thread running down here in Rome. Where do you place your shared memory? You know, maybe somewhere in between. You know, say, say, say you actually go in and decide you know, to place it in know, Brussels, uh, just to piss off the English a bit more. Uh, you, you put it in Brussels. What happens if the connectivity now fails between London and Brussels or with... Uh, with you know, Rome and Brussels. What happens? You can't access your shared memory anymore. You've got to, you start having a problem. And another problem you start having is latency. You know? So shared memory mutability, you know, there is a need for them, there's a use for them, but only if you're running on the same machine. And mo more often than not, what you do is you tend to use them for, uh, for speed. Uh, because you don't have to copy memory, you manipulate it, and it goes much faster. And it's great if nothing goes wrong. If we've got immutable state, you know, each process, you know, if, if your data gets corrupted, if a process gets corrupted and crashes, you lose that process, you lose all of the state associated with that process. But all the other processes will still continue running because they'll, they'll still continue running because they have the, the copy of their own data. So you know, that solves a huge problem. The same with location. You've got a process running in London and a process running in Italy. You don't need to locate state in this case because, once again, both processes will have a copy of their own data. So you don't locate state, you actually copy it. And, and if the connectivity between London and Rome happens to go down, it doesn't matter. Both processes can continue running. They'll both have a copy of their own data. You, you, you're following me here. So it, it's, uh, you know, and, and what you need to keep in mind, the new complexity which should start emerging now is when, with your immutability, when, when, when your connection, network connection comes back up. Now, you'll have two different processes who've been disconnected. They need to synchronize again. And usually, you know, you can use you know, different consistency models for your data. You could use eventual consistency, causal consistency, strong consistency, or even no consistency at all to resynchronize your data. And often you, know, you can use that with databases, distributed databases. You know, Cassandra is a great example of it. Or you, know, you can use CRDTs. Um, you, you, know, you need to handle that within your program, within the business logic of your program. So, I'm talking about mutable state and immutable state. Now, let's step back a second, because when I'm using the term mutable state and immutable state, I'm actually referring to two different types, you know, to shared memory versus no shared memory. You know, and where shared memory is uh, immutable, sorry, is mutable, and no shared memory is immutable. You're following me here? Because there's nothing which says that you can't do the no shared memory approach with Java, uh, I gave you the, the hint earlier, what you do is you just make sure that each thread is immutable so that other threads cannot manipulate data within a particular thread. And, yeah, and this is the right model. So you know, the right approach is to keep mutability in a thread or a process and let threads behave as immutable data structures, as data structures which actually copy their data instead of changing it. So, you know, even with Elixir, how many of you have dabbled with Elixir? None of you have, okay. One or two of you have, okay. E even with Elixir, variables are mutable in Elixir. You can change the value of your variable, and that's something you cannot do in Erlang. 
But that's fine because this mutability remains within the scope of a function and it remains within a particular process. So you're actually still using an immutable approach to concurrency. Now, now that you've got two copies of your data, you know, you've got processes running on the same machine, it, using concurrency based on immutable state allows you now to go in and distribute your system. So you can go in and you know, place processes running anywhere on any computer. So it could either be, uh, it could be different virtual machine, it could be different processes on the same machine. It could be different virtual machines running on the same hardware, on the same chipset. It could actually be virtual machines running on different chipsets. And at the cost of latency, you can actually start now distributing uh, your computation across multiple machines. So computing one single instance will slow you down, but all of a sudden, if you're computing with hundreds or even thousands of processes, that's going to give you the speed up because you, know, you start using you know, much more processing power. And that comes at the cost of latency. Um, obviously, you know, message passing within you know, two VMs running on the same chipset has a certain cost. Two VMs running on different chipsets, on different boards, different machines, will have a much higher cost. And you know, process running within the same VM, the cost will be say, low, much lower. And even within a VM, processes you know, running on the same core will, will be much cheaper for them to communicate versus you know, different processes on the same VM but running on different cores. So you know, the, the further away the data comes, you know, the, the, the more expensive you know, from each other, the, the, the more expensive it becomes for them to communicate. And you know, when latency starts mattering, uh, starts to matter, you know, if you, know, you need to have a response and within a certain, uh, a certain you know, time, phrase, time stamp, affinity becomes key. And so we're seeing a lot of this happening together today with edge computing, for example, um, where you'll actually have, you know, you, you might even use the processing power in base stations. Uh, to, to compute and, and manage. Um, imagine sending a WhatsApp message to someone uh, next to you. Instead of sending it to WhatsApp servers in the States, it would just go to a base station, and the base station would go, oh, you're, 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 you're right next to me. And so it will bounce it straight back to you, to, to, to the recipient, without you know, sending it off to some central server. And that's what edge computing is all about. You start moving the computation to the edge closer to, uh, to, the, to the data itself. It's almost, I mean, think of big data. We're assembling so much data today. What you do is, and moving this data is expensive, you start moving the compute to the data. So, you know, it's no secret, you know, they're building hard drives with CPU capacity so you can run your map reduce, you know, queries in the drive itself today. And so, you know, starting with embedded devices, they all have you know, multi-core you know, multi uh, today. There's no getting away from it. On uh, the left, you know, there's the Parallela board. And what it does, it has a, a dual-core ARM processor and a 16 or 64-core processor, as well as FPGA. It's the size of a credit card, and it costs about 100 bucks, consumes a few uh, watts of energy, literally two, three watts of energy. And on the right-hand side, even the Raspberry Pis today have you know, quad-core ARM processors. They started with the Raspberry Pi 2. And you know, it, it's been like that since 2015. A Cray 2 machine in 1980 uh, was considered a supercomputer. Your iPhones, you know, five, six years ago, had a much more processing power than supercomputers from you know, 30 years ago. So, this is where it's heading. It's heading towards multi-core. And you know, from some of the slowest kind of embedded hardware to the fastest computer in the world, or one of the fastest computers in the world, the Sunway Tao Light. Uh, it's the Chinese National Defense University. Uh, sorry, the Chinese National University of Defense Technology. So they're number one when it comes to supercomputers today. Here, you've got 10 million cores delivering 93,000 trillion floating operations per second. So that is a lot. And, uh, and what the Sunway, uh, you know, Sunway Tau Light and the Raspberry Pi or the Parallel Board have in common is the heterogeneous multi-core. So you have different types of cores, 
And that's the future of you know, the computers we'll be working on today. Uh, you, you know, com our computers will have CPUs, you know, they'll have GPUs, they'll have graphic cores, heavyweight CPUs, lightweight integer units, DSPs, cores for security. Um, they'll actually have cores which deal with networking, and in some cases, even cores which, well, where, you, where you've actually burnt in some of the operations you want to do in the hardware itself, um, so beyond FPGAs. Network on chips, so NOx, uh, I.O. and soft cores, you know, this is you know, post-FPGA. So whether you like it or not, the shift to multi-core is inevitable. And I think we all know, you know, parallelizing, well, for those of you who have tried to parallelize legacy C code, it's really, really hard. You know, you get some C code and you run it on a machine with one core, you know, you'll get a certain throughput. You run it on a machine with four cores, you'll get exactly the same throughput. Uh, you, know, you can argue something similar with Java, where the biggest issue to scaling a multi-core becomes memory lock contention, where you try to access shared memory. And you know, even there, you know, once you've started parallelizing C or even Java, debugging it becomes even harder. I don't, yeah, I don't know how many of you, you know, have chased kind of race conditions in Java, trying to understand what's going on. And you know, my argument today, my message today, I think, think is you know, that the right solution to it is multi-core, is immutability, it's processes which run with no shared memory. And indeed, I mean, back in you know, 2015, they actually had Erlang running on the Parallela board. It's been running on the Raspberry Pi since day one. They actually got it running, though, not on, on, on the ARM processor, but actually on the coprocessors. A coprocessor means that you know, you've got 16 cores or 64 cores on your chip. That means you can, you know, each core will have a few K of memory, and it's, you can actually communicate. The cores can't communicate with each other. So you can actually start running a little C thread or a little, you know, in this case, an Erlang process or an Elixir process on in the on each individual course, they'll do the computation, and then they'll send back the data. So they're there. You access them individually. They consume very little electricity. And given some data, they compute it and send back a result to, uh, you know, to the ARM processor, which acts as a kind of reduce, you know, which goes in and collects all of the answers and then reduces them. Uh, so. So the future is there. Now, so the point here now is we've got immutability. The immutability gives us a concurrency model. The concurrency model now gives us distribution. Because if we've got no shared state, we can now start distributing everything across multiple cores, but across multiple machines as well. Now, if we add multi-core to it and distribution, we get parallelism. And you need, even if you're dealing with multi-core, you will need the distribution because of Amdahl's law. How many of you have heard of Amdahl's law? Very few of you, okay. So I hope I'm not speaking over your heads, and if there are things which aren't unclear, just yell. But what Amdahl's law says, I mean, if you think of multi-core, when you start parallelizing a system, you start breaking it up into processes which run in parallel to each other. And what Anders law is, and so if you have a system, a parallel system, which will run on a machine with one core, and you then run it on a machine with eight cores, it should maybe run four to five times faster. Six, seven, six, seven times faster if, if you're lucky. So you go from eight co cores to 16 cores, this six times faster will become 12 times faster but you'll eventually hit a certain limit where by adding more cores, you won't get the system to run that much faster. Because what it says, you know, what Anders Law tells you is that you can you know, throw cores at your problem, but your program will still run as fast as its slowest component. And its slowest component is your sequential code. So assume that 50% you know, you, you, of your code is sequential, you cannot make your program run more than two times faster. Because you've got 50% sequential, you add many more cores, you get another 50% sequential. So these two sequential parts will run in parallel. 
And what we're seeing now, even if your program is highly parallel, your bottleneck will still be the virtual machine. So it will be the JVM, it will be the Beam, it will be you know, whatever virtual machine you start running. That's going to become your bottleneck because you still have schedulers, you still need to process and handle and schedule your different processes. Now, so all of us, so how do you solve that? Well, you run multiple virtual machines on the same, same machine. You know, we'll be seeing machines with a million cores within our lifetime. Don't be surprised if desktop computers will soon have a million cores in them. So we'll be seeing machines with a million cores. And there's no way you can have a VM spreading and running across a million cores and opt using them and optimizing them. So you know, the, the key here is distribution. You'll have multiple VMs wh which all run together and, and then interact. And so that will then give you, um, you know, that will give you your scalability. So multi-core and distribution together will then give you parallelism. So parallelism means things actually running in parallel, each running, you know, running in parallel on each core. And you know, the cost and the key here will be the latency and message passing, which you need to keep under control. And as I mentioned earlier, the biggest showstopper to actually scaling on multi-core is shared memory and memory long contention. So when you're trying to access shared memory, so the trick is you know, to use a programming language which doesn't have shared memory. And that is why you know, we're seeing you know, huge you know, scalability uh, advances uh, when, with the Beam. Now, let's take distribution a step forward. Once you have distribution, you also get two more things. You get scalability and you get reliability. So, I think one of my favorite sayings is you distribute for scale and you replicate for availability. So, you know, sc scalability and reliability are something which you, know, you often address in your architecture, in the architecture of your system. And the business logic you know, from day one. Um, what you need to think is you, know, you, need, you need a system which scales, you want to add 10 computers. So, you know, assume you're, you're handling 1,000 transactions per second and each machine uh, will handle 500, you need at least two computers. In fact, you need three computers, because if you lose one of the computers, your two machines will still be able to handle 1,000 transactions per second. But they need to have copies, copy of the data in order to execute. Are you following me here? So you still need that copy of the data. And so, you, know, you need to start thinking about this you know, from day one. It's not something you can go in and bolt on as an afterthought. And it ends up being uh, trade-offs between the consistency of your data and the availability of your system. So if you think of a banking application, for example, where you remove, an ad remove money and take away money from your account, what you end up doing is transactions across distributed machines. If the network between these machines go down, you might not be able to access the data. You might want to take down both machines. So a, a system which is strongly available uh, means that it is not reliable because, because of the reliability, you might want to take down, you need to take down the machines. On the other hand, if you don't worry about the reliability of your data, as long as you've got a value which is not too old, so I think a cache is a great example of it, as long as you have a value which is not too old, you, know, you can go in and distribute it and scale that way. If you lose a machine, you know, you'll have copies of it. It might not be the same copy, but it's still, you know, it, it's good enough, it's valid. And this, this is what we usually refer to a weaker consistency model. So it could be a causal consistency, eventual consistency. So eventually, you know, the data is going to propagate, but you're not guaranteed you know, that's going to be the case. And it ends up being always a trade-off between scalability and reliability. So, another item you need to think about is that the more components you add to your distributed system, the more likely um, you know, you'll have a risk of failure. And going, you know, especially having you know, something running in London and something running in Rome, there are a lot of things which can go wrong. Um, the machine, so, so the actual process which is handling your request could crash. Uh, the node, the, the virtual machine, 
which is, handles all the processes, could crash. The machine itself could crash, so you lose all of the VMs running on it. Or there's one last thing which could happen. You start having network issues. And with network issues, it starts getting tricky because you send a request, but you haven't received a response. So you don't know if you know, the server has actually executed that request. Or it could have executed and sent back a response which got lost. Or maybe the request never reached the server in the first place. So you know, as soon as you put a network in between, you also start adding uncertainty. And the beauty, if you're dealing with immutable state, a concurrency model based on immutable state, is that you handle all of these issues, all of these errors, in exactly the same way. So you, know, you send a request, you might lose the response. Oh, and there's one last thing is, you, know, you go in and you send a request, the receiving node might be up and running, might be perfectly healthy, but it's incredibly busy. So that the request actually times out, and you don't know, you know what the timeout was, you know, what the result of the timeout was. And so this failure now has to be handled in the business logic of your programs. You expose it to the programmers themselves. But the beauty of it is that it doesn't matter if it's a network going down, if it's a process crashing, if it's a computer crashing, if it's a virtual machine crashes, crashing, or if you actually lose the response, you handle these errors on the client side, so in London, in exactly the same way. You don't need to go in and distinguish between all of these different failure scenarios. And you do that in two ways. So the calls which go from the client to the server either are synchronous, so you send a request and you expect the result back, or they're asynchronous. If they're asynchronous, you fire and forget, and you need to expect the receiving party and to maybe lose the message, to never receive it. So asynchronous calls are the most scalable ones. You fire and forget. If they don't receive them, you know, too bad. Uh, you know, we need to handle that in, in our logic. And you would obviously never do that for you know, a bank transactions, for example. But you would do that for an SMS. You know, how many of you have not received SMSs which were sent? You know, it's, you know, something went wrong along the way. We never got the acknowledgement. If you're dealing with synchronous calls, there are three different mod there are two different models. So asynchronous are at the most once. Synchronous, you do exactly once or at least once. Exactly once means you send a request and you wait for a response to come back. If you get an error back, you don't know if the response has been, you, you don't know if that request has been handled or not, and you need to go in and investigate. So in a banking transaction, you would use the at least once, uh, sorry, exactly once notification. And if there's a network error, when the network comes back up, you go in and check the state. So you're, you're taking money out of an ATM machine, you would want to net, then follow up on it. And at least once means that you start sending a request, and if you don't get a response back, you send the request to another machine, another computer, and another computer, and another computer. And you keep on sending it to multiple computers until you hopefully get a response back. How many of you have ever received three copies of the same SMS? Yeah, a few of you. Two copies? Yeah, a few more, yeah. And that was the at least once request, where they sent a, copy, you know, they sent a request, hey, send this SMS. You didn't get back a response, you send it again and it got sent again. There have been cases where I received five or six copies of that SMS originating from a machine. So these are, you know, these are the things you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with distribution. But errors are handled in exactly the same way in your system. So programming a distributed system doesn't need to be much harder if you're using the right tools for the job. And that's where, once again, immutability becomes critical. So, this is where we are today. Now, we need to deal with all of this in the future. Now, I will leave you from, with a tweet you know, sent in the future, which is, you know, what does the future hold? And the future, if you ask me, will hold, you know, hold affine linear session and dependent types. Now, just don't ask anyone, uh, you know, don't, don't mention them to anyone, because once again, they might ask you what it means. And if you want to know what it means, you'll probably have to come back here next year when I'll go in and talk about them. Uh, I think it's beyond the scope of this talk itself. 
but this is what's now happening when we're dealing with distribution. We're starting to use certain levels of types which handle requests and handle failure in a particular way. So I think you know, there's much more which will be coming when it comes for this. So the future of concurrent programming is functional. Uh, you know, being scaling on a multi-core chipset or on a multi-core architecture or even in distributed environments. Uh, and that's everywhere, you know, from embedded, you know, from your phone or a Raspberry Pi all the way to the, the NSA's supercomputer, which, you know, go in and, and, and read and you know, snoop into everyone's lives. And the thing is, you might not be using functional programming languages on a day-to-day -day basis, but going out and learning a functional programming language will make you a much, much better programmer because what you do is you end up using these paradigms. Uh, I hear a lot of people, oh, but they're forcing us to do this in Java. Okay, do it in Java, but design it using principles such as, you know, principles you know, with immutability. Make sure that your threads become immutable. And you start thinking in those terms, you start architecting in those terms, your life you know, will become much, much easier. And I would say, you know, this is, for those of us you know, who've been working with functional programming for you know, the last 20 years, this is not the revenge of the nerds, but it's actually the revenge of the functional programmers where finally, you know, uh, a lot of these concepts are becoming mainstream, uh, you know, which we've been using at. And, you know, look at Java 8. You know, how, lo how long has it taken them to start adding, you know, paradigms, you know, functional programming paradigms in Java 8? Um, so, you know, I think, you know, you might not, you know, the, the, the future languages will be functional, they'll have, be heavily influenced, be influenced by functional programming, even though they won't necessarily be called functional. Now, I've been doing Erlang for 20 years. I've always argued Erlang is not a functional programming language. It's a concurrent language which was heavily influenced by functional programming. So, and I think you know, this is a beautiful quote uh, by Joel Spolsky. You know, programming you know, consists of two things, you know, accidental difficulties. Uh, things which are difficult because you happen to be using the wrong tool for the job. And, actual, and, and things which are actually difficult for which no programming language or tool is going to solve. And I think hopefully uh, what you'll take away from today is that you, you want to focus on actual difficulties, the real problem you, you're trying to solve. And by using the right tools for the job, all the accidental difficulties will go away because you don't have to deal with them. Yeah. So, yeah. Any questions? It's a bit of a heavy lecture to be, you know, <laughs> to, to deliver at the end of the day. But, you know, I'll be around, so if you do have any questions, feel free to come up and ask, you know. Thank you very much.